Thank you for checking out this no spoilers movie review. This is for the 1982 Dario Argento film Tenebre or Tenebri. I don't know. However, people want to say it. When I'm doing this review, it is currently streaming on the Shutter Horror Streaming Service, so check it out there. They also have some other Argento stuff on there. So cool uh, when I'm bringing this up. So um, real quick, if people could let me know, I'm, I've been messing with the audio on my review videos, so I cranked up the gain, well cranked up, I turned up the gain a little bit on this, so you might hear a little bit more background noise, but you should be able to hear me better, so you don't have to crank your volume. So let me know down in the comments if it is better in comparison to older videos, or do I need to crank it up more? I don't know. Just let me know. Anyway, to Dario Argento's Tenebre. Not my favorite. I will say right off the bat, I did enjoy this film. It's not my favorite of Argento's films. I think at the moment, I really like Suspiria, obviously. Everyone really likes Suspiria. I like Demons a lot. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I really, really like Deep Red. Deep Red is such a nice Giallo film. I haven't seen a ton of Giallo films, but I'm trying to go through a bunch. Actually, I have every one I've watched thus far, I have a review for on this channel, and I'm going through doing like a ranked list of all of them. So at the moment, I think Deep Red is my favorite of all of them. And, you know, if you want to see what other ones I have watched, go check out my other videos. Um, so this film, Tenebre, was done right after Argento had done Inferno, and right before he did Phenomena. Now, I have a review up for Inferno. I don't have one for Phenomena. I haven't watched that yet, but trust that will happen at some point soon. So he had, I was looking at his IMDb credits, and I realized he had a stretch of 10 years that were really, it was a really good 10 years as far as, you know, what people think of Argento now with his films. <clears throat> so within that 10-year stretch, it was 1975 to 85. Um, I think it was 75 to 85. Uh, was He released Deep Red, Suspiria, Inferno, Tenebre, and Phenomena. That's a pretty good run. Um, this was his return to Giallo, by the way, Tenebre was, um, considering that, you know, he had done Inferno before it, Inferno was a return to, well, actually, Inferno was after Suspiria, so it was Suspiria and then Inferno, and those were the two witch movies he was doing, and people thought, and I think he thought, actually, that he was, he was going to finish off his trilogy that he had in mind, um, that he eventually did finish off with Mother of Tears much later, but I thought pe people thought, and he thought that he was going to go ahead and just, you know, make that finish, finish it up. But uh, he didn't because Inferno didn't actually do all that well. So he was like, well, let me return to Giallo. People really seem to like that for me, and people are kind of asking for it more. So let's give that a, a go. Let's try and fix this lighting a little. No? No, yeah, whatever. Anyway, I'll do it in post. Sorry. Um, so this was a return to Giallo. Now I'm just going through my notes as I have them written down as I was watching the movie. Uh, so he wrote this actually based on two things at the moment. He was living in LA at the time and there was, he wasn't in the best of areas and there was an incident where he, it was some hotel he was staying at and a, a person there got shot in the lobby of this hotel. And so he just kind of like started taking note more of how violent and awful <laughs> LA was at that time so he was like uh, he did move and he actually ended up moving because the other part of his experience was that he had this really obsessed fan who kept contacting him and the f it it was fine at first but then it got to a point where the fan was like saying that he wanted to harm him saying that he wanted to kill him and that because of the work that Argento had done and because he got so much into Argento's work that all of a sudden that was affecting his psyche and making him feel different ways and become more violent and stuff. So he wanted to, you know, exact revenge on Argento in a sense. So it got really bad really fast, so that's why he moved. But that experience plus the violence he experienced when he was in L.A. Uh, kind of prompted him to write this script for Tenebre. And throughout the movie, if you keep the, those stories in mind, it, you really see it in his writing. You see him working through it. And I think it actually turns into him mentally working through the issues that he mentally has with those things in his life through the script. Just like you can see in the story and how it, it develops and some of the dialogue, how he's working things out as he's writing the script. And I think that's a very interesting thing to know when you're going into watching it. So I would say if you've already seen the film, 
with this information in mind, go back and watch it again and think about that. And I mean, see if you think I'm right, but I think I am with that. Um, so several members of Goblin actually came back to do the score for this. And you can tell it has that kind of Goblin type sound to it, but it's also extremely 80s at the same time. There's sort of like some synth things in there. And the way they do uh, some of like the bass lines in the music is very much like an 80s kind of like cop drama type thing. You'll know what I'm talking about if you've seen it or if you do see it. Um, so this film actually ended up having moderate success in Italy, but it was uh, labeled as one of the video nasties in the United Kingdom. Now, for people who don't know, the video nasties were basically films that were banned in the UK because they were considered to be too violent, too gory, too horrific. Uh, and I believe the first film that, that started the Video Nasties list in the UK was uh, the original Evil Dead, if I'm not mistaken. I had heard that from Eli Roth on his History of Horror um, podcast because, yes, it was a show, but they also released all the uncut edit, uh, unedited interviews as a podcast, which... The show is very awesome. The podcast is very awesome. Definitely check those out. But he had said that Evil Dead was the first of the video nasties. So Tenebra got nailed uh, as being one of the video nasties in the UK. So it didn't actually end up getting released in the UK until 1999. So 82 to 99, that's a ways to go. And then it actually got a release only after two years in the United States. It was in 1984. But it wasn't released as Tenebre. It was released as a film called Unsane, and it was heavily censored, apparently. So it didn't do all that well. Its popularity in the United States is more now partially because of, you know, cult films become cult films only over time. But also, it was so heavily censored, and not only in the later years after its original release did it, you know, did you get an uncensored version? You got more of the actual film as it was meant to be and people just appreciate that more and it's a better film that way supposedly so um argento has a tendency in a lot of his films to go with more grandiose settings as far as buildings go when he's shooting in italy and he did shoot in rome for this film so you would think oh man he's gonna go do like some of the big landmarks and usually he'll do that he and he gets like the the very amazing looking beautiful intricate architectures and that's one of the things I've always loved about Argento's films is he shows that. It looks so beautiful. You get like these wide shots of this amazing architecture and the way he'll just like with the camera work just uh, go on journeys through these really interesting looking buildings with the, uh, the characters. Always great. So for this film, he stepped it back a little bit and he went more for showing not like those big grandiose buildings, but showing the more modern side of Rome which I think is cool. It's more of like, a okay, people kind of like know what Rome's known for. Let me show you another side of Rome. It's modern. It's not just classic and, and, and beautiful and traditional. It's also, you know, it's now. It's 80s. It's modern. And that really did come through in the settings uh, with the film. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the settings and, and add their camera work and stuff a little bit later. Um, so the majority of the kills in this are actually done in bright, in light, not at night, which is a, a different thing, a kind of jarring thing, uh, you would think, especially then, because with horror in general, the the deaths and kill scenes typically happen in the dark at night because it's scarier. But there's something more jarring about with that's the trend, doing it in daylight. And I think that's actually something that the newer film Midsummer did really well, is it is very bright when all the you know horrific stuff ends up happening. And so for Argento to have to done that, uh, have done that back in 1982, it's kind of a very forward-thinking thing. It's kind of breaking from the trend. And I wonder if he decided to do that because of the the violence that he saw in L.A. Because a lot of the violence was broad daylight type violence. So I wonder if that was kind of where he got part of that from. So there's a big oh the other thing about the 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 kills is they're very quick. And they're very violent, and there's a lot of gore. So I understand why it, it got hit with Video Nasty's list, and I understand why it was heavily censored in the United States. Um, for that time, I'm saying. I don't say I, I'm not saying I agree with it. I just understand why that happened at that time. Because, uh, yeah, it's really violent, and um, the, the deaths are quick, though, too. Uh, but well done. 
Uh, so there's a uh, there's criticism of sexist writing in this film, which actually seems a lot to me like Argento making a comment about him himself about himself and some of his films because he has had that um, that criticism before. Um, so he kind of works it out in here as being like, hey, this is just creativity, this is entertainment, and it ties not as film in the film. It ties in as the book to Nibre, which is a, a large part of the film. So I feel like the author in this film with their book is a lot like the embodiment of Argento himself with his films. And he's kind of working out this thing of like, okay, I've been criticism for being too violent, being too sexist. So he puts that on his character and that's thrown at them a lot. And they're just kind of like, I'm, you know, I'm creative this is entertainment like you can't hold me responsible for what people do based off you know what i'm putting out there as as creative consumption or as creative stuff to be consumed and that kind of goes to the story i was telling earlier about you know that obsessed fan being like you know i'm so into your stuff and now it's making me want to do things and now i want to kill you so it kind of seemed like throughout the film as he's writing the script like he argento he's struggling with this like trying to work out in his head should i feel responsible for stuff like this should i feel responsible if someone sees my films and they take that as uh inspiration to be violent or to kill someone or be sexist or whatever so you kind of see like the struggle of him like working it out through the script which i think is a really interesting aspect of uh, thinking about that while you watch the film um so this speaks to the idea of books and film making people violent and blaming the creators for that. So this is tying into it. So this is actually something that was going on a lot back then too. And that's why a lot of the censorship ended up starting um, because people started to point to violence in society and say, oh, this is because of horror movies, it's because of violent, you know, like we're having right now. It's because of violent video games. You know, it, this type of thing is always has always been said that the the creatives out there who are doing kind of fringe stuff or what's considered to be fringe stuff at the time are the ones who are giving people ideas and then they're acting upon it as if stop giving people ideas it's your fault and this film kind of like throws a lot of opinions out about that and obviously it ties into what i was talking about before with argento kind of struggling with that himself there was a really funny line in this i really want to bring up real quick i only drink on duty this uh, investigator, like homicide investigator, said. I thought that was pretty funny. I was very caught off guard by it because they, he was like offered a drink and someone was like, oh, well, I assume you don't drink on duty. I'm sorry. He's like, oh, no, I only drink on duty. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's funny. And that's the thing. Like Argento will kind of put like some funny, witty things in here or there, but he does it in a way that it doesn't mess things up because horror can really, when you're going for something more serious and more violent and more scary, um, or drama driven or thriller driven uh when you throw in something funny it can really just like mess up the pace and the feel of everything and that doesn't happen with what he does uh the the film is extremely sexual it's very very clear that this is not from a female perspective uh this film and so i, I think it speaks a little bit more to the sexism of of the time argento and the time and argento probably because of the time like that was way more acceptable then and it would actually help you with um getting butts in the seats at theaters to be honest so you know and it's still something that horror fans are like hey you know if there's not a good you know it's not a good story or there's a problem with this just put some nudity in it and i'm good you know it's still a thing so i understand uh, so there's a crane shot that they use in this, which I, I've heard people refer to before as being used by other filmmakers, kind of taking it and being like, that's a cool idea. I really like the way that shot worked. So it's like kind of this crane shot where they're going like around the side of a building and like the, uh, the top of it and then coming around. And you're seeing through some windows. So you're seeing some things that are going on outside of and inside of the building from the outside. And it's cool. It's a great concept. It's a really cool idea. I like how it works for the most part. But I feel like it also takes way too long, which makes it kind of boring. They have a really large portion where they're showing you just shingles on a roof. So I feel like they should have just like moved it a little faster or just sped up the film at that point to move it a little faster. I don't know. But um, cool idea. 
there's some really good stuff about it, but it also gets really boring and seems a little too long. But, you know, for the time, great idea. So there's a bunch of use of sound of water in this. And actually, when I say a bunch, uh, like three times maybe, um, they, there's one in particular where it's kind of like bubbles underwater, which I think just sounds very pleasing and interesting. And that's another thing that I feel like Argento does really well in his films. He has a lot of good Foley work. Uh, in all of his films, it's for these interesting sounds that, that he brings to the forefront that, that can help with the mood. It, it, it feels weird. It feels kind of creepy, odd. You know, it. his Foley work is always really good, his, his auditory effects, should I say. And then another one is just like running water that also sounded very interesting. But there was a tie-in, and there was later, like, uh, a weapon ends up in water. I'm not going to say too much about it because I'm not giving things away. So, but the the use of water in it was really interesting, and the sound that it made, very interesting. Because uh, it's, it's actually, like, kind of soothing, but what's going on at the time when it's soothing you is also messed up and disturbing. So it's kind of this, you know, these opposing forces at the same time. So the POV uh, killer camera work that's been done in Giallo films all the time, including Argento's, just like usual, works quite well in this film. I like it. What is Argento's obsession with animals attacking people? He does this a lot. There is a dog attack in this movie. Sorry, it's kind of a spoiler. The uh, other movies I've watched of his, he has birds attacking people, he has cats attacking people, he has rats attacking people. It's always about animals attacking people. What is with him? It's an obsession. It's just weird. Um, so Argento has an awesome knack for interesting locations. Choosing interesting locations to shoot at, but not just doing that, but showcasing them extremely well because of the lighting that he uses and the camera work that he uses. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier before. I feel like he just picks really interesting locations, whether it's outside or inside, usually buildings, and he takes his time in them. He lights them in a very interesting way so you can see what is interesting about that location. And then he has the characters interact with them in an interesting way and go slow enough, not too slow, but slow enough that you as an audience member can really take in the setting. And he just has such an amazing knack for that. And I really, really love it. And for that reason, the way he executes all those things, it kind of makes it feel like a journey. Um, when you're going through these locations. And it's a good thing because with these Giallo films in particular, uh, it's an investigation. And so it kind of adds to that investigative feel because you go into this new location as an audience member. Sometimes the characters are going in for the first time as well. And it's very exploratory. And it just comes across so well in the film. And it, that's one of the things I love about how Argento does film. So... Uh, it's kind of like by writing the script, Argento was trying to figure out if he thought his movies made him responsible for the actions of those people obsessed with him or not. I was kind of saying this earlier, but like I said, watch it again and think about that. It's very interesting to watch it that way. Um, like any good giallo, there are a solid number of characters introduced in this, so it really does keep you guessing who is the killer. There are a lot of twists to it. I feel like that aspect of it is probably the best portion of this film. In addition to all the, like, the technical things I was talking about that Argento does and creative things, um, as far as the story goes, I think the best thing is that you keep guessing. Like There's so many characters that are introduced that at many times you're kind of like, well, I kind of think it could be this person. Well, now I kind of think it could be this person. Well, now I think it could be this person. And it keeps you guessing until the end, pretty much. Some people might see it coming, but I, it, it took me quite a while until I saw it coming. And it was pretty close to the end when I saw it coming. So I was just like, oh, okay, here we go. So, well done. Uh, there, there is one scene towards the end, actually, where the gore is over the top. It is very graphic. It is, there's a ton of blood. And I was just like, whoa, he really went for it on that one. He was just like, you want gratuitous? Here's gratuitous, and uh, it makes for an interesting scene. It's kind of fun in a way for that, but that's one where I'm just like, yeah, that 
that is probably what they pointed to for the video nasties list and that is probably one of the things that got edited in the u.s cut as unsane um so yeah there's a good twist at the end but there are a few things that are actually very unrealistic about the twist and unbelievable for the world that's been set and making it seem realistic it just doesn't it doesn't come together. So overall, I liked how it wrapped up. I like where the story went. I like how it ended. But there were some aspects of how things played out in the end where I was just like, that's not realistic. That's not believable. Uh, if those things would have been taken out, if things would have been a little more believable, I would have liked it even more. But overall, I did like the film. I mean, there's a lot to like when Argento is doing film. So that said, that's all my stuff I covered. I it's pretty long, actually. Um, but giving it a five-star rating uh, out of five stars with half stars in play. Hmm. I like it. I don't, like, love it a ton. No, 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 no. Where am I on this? I don't know. I feel like I got to give it a four. And story-wise, I don't think it gets a four on its own. But I think with all the creative flair and extra things that come with an Argento film, it just kind of bumps it to a four. So I give it a four rating. Obviously, that's a pretty good recommendation for me. Uh, see it. If you haven't seen Tenebre, see it. Also see other Argento films, especially as Giallo's Deep Red. Like I said, I really like Deep Red. I've actually been thinking about rewatching that. I liked it so much. So anyway. But thanks, everyone, for checking this out. Put some comments down there. Have you seen this film? Have you not seen it? Do you want to see it? What are your thoughts? Uh, please help me out. Do that. Subscribe. Because that's the way you can repay me. It literally takes you a second. Totally painless. And it encourages me to keep doing this because it's a good time. But thanks, everyone, for checking this out. Until next time, keep it brutal.